clapping, right? Well, when you guys were clapping for me, it was like me. It was like, make them stop clapping. Don't encourage them. And then evil Kermit inner me was like, no, make them keep clapping. Receive their praises. You guys can't do that to me. That's dangerous. Keep clapping for me. I'm just going to keep taking it. No, stop, stop. <laughs> Uh, well, anyways, um, yeah, we got to cut that off quick. Uh, welcome to Catalyst, guys. Welcome again. I'm super excited you guys are all back. Uh, we, uh, as a staff, we work about probably at least half or maybe a little bit more of the time that you guys are gone on break. Uh, but the times that we're working when you guys are on break, it's boring. So I'm, I'm glad you guys are back. I'm really excited for small groups to start. I'm really excited for this semester. And I'm really excited for our sermon series for this semester. Uh, our, our series is titled, A Line of Sinners to Save Sinners. And uh, we wanted to do something in the Old Testament, since we've been in the New Testament for Romans, uh, Corinthians, and then the book of John. Uh, but we also wanted to do something uh, kind of at least uh, focusing on Jesus, kind of coming off of the book of John especially. Um, so we kind of picked and designed this series, um, A Line of Sinners to Save Sinners, to show how God works in and through sinful people to bring redemption to, to humanity. Um, and so in this series, we're going to cover some of the most faithful men and women uh, in, in the Bible and history, and we're going to cover some pretty wicked ones as well. Uh, but what I think is so unique about the lineage of Jesus, the lineage of Christ, the actual physical lineage that God used to bring uh, the Messiah into the world, uh, is that uh, God was not deterred by humanity's sinful nature. Um, and this lineage of Christ uh, shows us, uh, as Paul puts it, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, while we were sinners, while the people before Jesus were sinners, while the people when Jesus came were sinners, Christ died for us. And he works through our sinful nature as well to bring us redemption. Um, and so this is going to be a cool series. I'm excited about it. Um, our first character in the series is Abraham. Uh, if you guys have your YouVersion apps, we are still doing that, so you can pull up on your YouVersion on the Bible app, and you can go to events, and then it should be Catalyst, and you can click on that. Um, usually we'll have our, some of our points, maybe a quote, um, and then the, the passages that we're referencing, things like that. Kind of a handy tool, but there's also the good old-fashioned Bible as well. Um, but Abraham is our first character. Abraham's pretty well-known character in the Bible, Right? Aside from Moses, he's actually the second most referenced uh, Old Testament character in the New Testament. Uh, both James and Paul use him as a model of faith. They say, okay, look at what Abraham did when they're talking about faith. Uh, the prophet Isaiah refers to Abraham as a friend of God, which Abraham is the only person in, in all of the Bible to have that title, so pretty cool. And then on top of all of this, there's the famous children's song, Father Abraham, had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. If you don't know that, man, ask somebody to teach it to you later. That's a good one. Uh, but he's a, he's a famous guy. He's a famous guy. Uh, but his story covers the span of about 14 chapters of Genesis. Uh, so it's a big chunk of an even bigger book. And so we're, what we're going to do is, is, is walk through Abraham's life, and we're going to hit some of the high points of his life uh, with an emphasis on some of his biggest moments of faith and an emphasis on some of his biggest moments of weakness, some of his biggest moments, uh, lapses of faith, if you will. And so uh, we're not going to be able to hit everything again because it spans 14 chapters, but uh, we're going to do a, a good overview. And then we're going to talk about how and what we can learn from how God worked in Abraham's life. And so the, uh, if you turn your Bibles, you can go to Genesis chapter 12, where it's on the U version there. Um, but Abraham's story starts in Genesis chapter 11. Um, it's after the flood, after the Tower of Babel, um, a few hundred years after that. And, uh, and we see that uh, where God meets Abraham, he's living in a town called Ur, uh, which was a city that was dedicated to foreign gods. And uh, at that point, his name was Abram. Uh, and of course, we know his, his name will later be changed to Abraham as part of the covenant that God gave him. I'm just going to refer to him as Abraham for this entire sermon, just for simplicity's sake. Um, and then we also see that in, in the end of uh, chapter 11 that, that he was uh, 75 years old, or we can determine that he was 75 years old when God called him. Uh, so it's safe to say that uh, Abraham, before he was called by God, probably had um, almost no knowledge of who God was. Uh, maybe he had heard stories or knew the history of the flood or the Tower of Babel. Uh, maybe he knew a little bit about God, but probably not much. Um, and the fact that he was living in a city that was dedicated to foreign gods and he was 75 years old, it's safe to say that Abraham was probably a sinner when uh, God called him to follow him. Uh, 
Um, and then we'll see throughout his life that he was still a sinner and made mistakes uh, throughout his life. But I want to start in chapter 12, where we see God coming to Abraham and calling him initially. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. It says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Abram, <laughs> Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him. Um, so we see here that God calls Abraham to follow him. Uh, and it's kind of interesting, uh, coming off of the, the gospel books and then now looking at uh, the story of Abraham, uh, both Jesus and God, I guess, just kind of use the same method of getting people to follow him. They just kind of go up and say, hey, follow me. And people are like, ah, all right. Um, but that's what God does. I mean, there's probably a lot more here. Uh, maybe there was an introduction, but God comes to Abraham. He's like, hey, follow me. Uh, I want you to do something. And it comes with a promise. He says, you know, I'll bless you. I'll, uh, I'll actually turn you into a great nation and all of the nations and families of the earth will be blessed through you. And so Abraham, he believed God. Um, and we know that he believed God because he did it. He up and got, a, got up and uh, it took his family and he moved away from his family and his people and his town and followed God. Um, now, the reason I think this is such a big kind of moment of faith in Abraham's life is, uh, and I actually think it's a really underrated moment in Abraham's life, uh, is because back then you got to think of the time and culture that they were in. Um, there weren't very many safety nets set up at this uh, point in, in, uh, in the earth's history. Um, there weren't even probably a ton of towns or countries. Uh, lots of cities were probably ruled by kings and that sort of thing. Um, and so for somebody like Abraham, your, a known city, your people, your clan that you come from, I mean, that's everything. You don't always know in this time period of the earth, you don't always know what's over the mountaintop. You don't always know what's a couple hundred miles this way or a couple hundred miles that way. Um, and you can't, if you get into big trouble, you can't ring home or ring the police or anything like that. So traveling even away from your family and your clan and your city is a really big deal. Um, probably not this bad, but I kind of imagine it like in The Walking Dead, like in like the later series, right, after the zombies aren't as much of the threat, and there's like roving bands and bad people, and there's like little societies getting set up. Um, I don't think it was nearly that barbaric, but inevitably there were some bad people, right, wandering around, uh, picking off travelers and families, traveling from place to place. Um, that certainly was one of the things that Abraham had to worry about. And on the top of that, he was 75 years old. There was a lot of faith that went into this. But Abraham trusts that God will protect, protect him and provide for him, and uh, and he does what he says. And so this is kind of his first act of faith. Then later on in chapter 12, if you're looking at your, your Bible, your, uh, your heading might say something like Abram and Sarai in Egypt. Um, I don't know what it is about Egypt, but in the Bible, it's, it's like the political swinging pendulum in America or something. It's like every eight years we go to Egypt because there's a famine or somebody's trying to kill us and we uh, go back to Egypt or something. It's like Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat. I don't know. Egypt's like this nefarious land where people just go to when they're in trouble and then they come back later. Jesus, Israelites, sometimes they stay there for a couple hundred years and then come back dramatically. Um, but anyways, there's a famine in the land Abraham and Sarah, they're like, you know what, we're going to go to Egypt and, and kind of wait this out. And so they go to Egypt. I don't think that was really the lapse of faith. Maybe that was part of it. Um, but they go to Egypt, and Abraham is scared uh, that somebody is going to see his wife, Sarah, and want to kill him and take her as their wife. Um, evidently, Sarah was very beautiful, and it says that. And evidently, Abraham had reason to believe that because he told Sarah, he said, hey, if anybody asks, just tell them that, you're, that I'm your brother and you're my, you're my sister so that they won't kill me. And turns out Abraham was right, I guess, because they go into Egypt. Pharaoh sees Sarah and he's like, hey, Abraham, what's up with that girl? And he's like, oh, she's my sister. And so then Pharaoh's like, well, I'll have her as my wife then. And so, uh, <laughs> so I mean, he wasn't wrong in being scared, but he should have trusted in God a little bit more. So then she goes off to Pharaoh's uh, house, and there's this big whole mess and everything. And then Pharaoh finds out, and he's like, are you serious, dude? Why didn't you just tell me? You brought shame on my house. And he's like, take her back and, and take these gifts and, and get out of my land. Um, and so this was really, it's kind of a strange story, but it's a definite lapse of faith on Abraham's part. Because if you remember back in, at the beginning of 12, God says, 
I'll make you into a great nation, right? It says all of the families of the earth will be blessed through you. And so, yeah, God's talking to Abraham, but if Abraham's going to have uh, a lineage that is blessed after he's gone, then Sarah's clearly a part of this promise, right? And so if Abraham really had faith that God was going to protect him and Sarah, he wouldn't have needed to lie to Pharaoh and conjure up this, this weird story that really put Sarah in a lot of jeopardy when they went to Egypt. So this was a major lapse of faith on Abraham's part. Um, he didn't fully trust that God would protect them. Moving into verses 13 and 14, or chapters 13 and 14, uh, we, we see the somewhat famous chapter uh, 13 where uh, Abraham and Lot, they're coming back out of Egypt, and God's like, yeah, this is the land that will be yours. And uh, they're, they're farming the land, and there's some strife between Lot's farmers or, or, or uh, sheep tenders, whatever you call them. Sounds like a food, like chicken tenders, sheep tenders. I'd eat that. So there's strife between Lot and Abram's uh, people, and Abraham's like, hey, we're, we're from the same family, but let's not quarrel. Let's, I'll go one way, you go the other, and uh, you pick, Lot. You want this side of this you know, mountain range, or you want this side, basically. And so Abraham kind of has some faith in God that, that God's going to bless him regardless. And so Lot looks, and he kind of takes the, the more favorable side to raise his cattle on and move his family to. And so they part ways. Um, and then in chapter 14 is, is kind of, and we won't do this on every chapter. We don't have time, but we're hitting the high points. Um, in chapter 14, there's this kind of crazy story where um, these, these kings team up from a, a, a different uh, a different area, and they come to Lot's area and the city that Lot was nearby, and they conquer it, and they take a bunch of people as captives. And Lot is and his family get taken away as captives. And so then we see in chapter 14, there's not a ton of detail, but Abraham kind of acts as this like war general, and he's like, no, nah, no, nah, Lot's my family, that's my kindred, like they're not getting taken as captives. So he grabs his fighting men, because apparently if you're Abraham, you have 300 fighting men. Um, he grabs his fighting men, and they pursue these kings. He divides them up, and they conquer these kings who just conquered a city. So, I don't know. There's some pretty crazy stuff going on. Um, and then he, gra- he, he gets Lot, and he brings him back. And so this chapter uh, is, is kind of leading into chapter 15, uh, which I think is really interesting because God comes and he talks to Abraham again in chapter 15, right after this, this battle, and, and where Abraham went out and he physically fought to bring Lot back. Um, God comes and he talks to Abraham in chapter 15. And so look at what it says in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So it's kind of funny. Abraham just defeats these kings, right? And then God comes and he says, hey, fear not, Abraham, I'll protect you. Like, I'm your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Fear not, I'll protect you. And Abraham's kind of like, yeah, I got that. Uh, Like, kind of just did this whole battle thing, saw that you protected me, but what about like the sun part? What about the making me into a great nation part? Like, God, are you, where does that fit in here? And so uh, he says, the heir of my house is some other guy. It's probably a, you know, a hired hand who is, who is heavily trusted or something like that. Um, and so then in verse three, it says, and Abram said, behold, you have given me no offspring and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So that's the section that Paul quotes in Romans, where it says that Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's the section he quotes in Romans. Um, But it's kind of an interesting section here. God comes, says, Hey, I'll protect you. Abraham's like, Yeah, but what about the son part? Like, so... Still kind of waiting on that. Um, but I think that this is a big, a big moment of faith for Abraham. And I think that we see this in our lives sometimes too. Uh, maybe we're waiting on God to do something or show us something or speak to us in a specific area of our life, right? And we can believe in God and, and, but still wonder, are you coming through over here, right? Maybe we look around and when we look at our churches and we see God working, we look at our community, we look at our friends, we see God working and moving. We look even maybe at 
specific areas of our life and we see God moving and working, but then there's just this one thing that we're waiting on. And we're like, God, <laughs> what about this thing? Like, I'm still waiting on this. Sometimes it can get hard, get hard to continue to trust that uh, God has your, your, best, uh, your best will in mind, that God's going to show up in this area, even though he's showing up in all these other places. Um, but, but it says that, that Abraham believed God. And I think, that's, I think that's kind of a strong thing to say, because sometimes it can be really easy to believe that God exists, believe that God is working you know, in general maybe in the world, believe that God is working in other people's lives, but sometimes it can be hard to believe that God's working in your life, or that God's working in your life specifically, when you haven't seen any kind of progress in that area, right? But Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So that's another big moment of faith for Abraham. Moving on into chapter 16, we see another lapse of faith for Abraham. Uh, Abraham and Sarah, they, they start to get a little tired of waiting for God to come through. They start to get a little tired of waiting for, um, for a child to be given to them uh, so that their offspring can, can become a great nation. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately it's pretty cut and dry. They're waiting for God to give them a kid. It's like Sarah's either pregnant or she's not. They either have a kid or they don't. And they don't. And so they're waiting and they're waiting and they're like, you know, maybe this is how it's supposed to happen. And so Sarah comes to Abraham and she's like, hey, Abraham, maybe this is how God wants it to happen. Maybe God wants you to have a son on my behalf with my servant Hagar. And Abraham's like, well, maybe, okay, yeah, all right, let's try it. And so Abraham and Hagar, they get together, and uh, Hagar is with child, and all of a sudden, surprise, surprise, Hagar decides that she doesn't really want to have a kid on Sarah's behalf. And so she's looking at Sarah now with disdain. And then Sarah's mad at Abraham, and she's like, Abraham, this is your fault because, you know, you allowed this to happen or whatever, and now she's looking at me with disdain because she wants it to be her kid and not mine on my behalf, and it's this big old problem. And if you want to see the whole problem, you can just read the whole chapter. And so then Abraham says, hey, you know, he kind of takes a passive step back, and he says, Sarah, this is, you know, she's your servant. You deal with her as you will. So then he kind of allows Sarah to treat Hagar badly. And so Sarah treats Hagar badly. We see that in the story. And Hagar runs away. She tries to get away from them, and she runs off into the desert, and she almost dies. And then the angel of the Lord comes uh, and finds her and helps her. And ultimately, it seems in the story that years kind of patch these wounds, and Abraham uh, treats Hagar and Ishmael, her son, very, very well. Um, but this was a lot of drama. And it, I mean, it, we only get a chapter of it. You know how family drama is. You know how things that go wrong in your family are. I mean, it's, it's like constant. It's the bitterness and it's the everyday, right? I mean, this was a big problem for Abraham and Sarah. And this was a major lapse of faith. And I think that this whole story really caused a lot of trouble and strife. And I think that the writer of Genesis makes it very clear that this was a lapse of faith on the part of Abraham by showing how much tension and strife came out of this decision. And here what we really see, I think, is that Abraham seemed to grow tired of waiting for God. He, was, he didn't see any progress in the area that he was looking for. And he didn't see God moving in the specific area that he wanted God to move in. And so he said, well, maybe it'll happen this way, and we'll try this instead. Um, and he did something that really was not a good idea. So there's a lot more to Abraham's story, but we're going to jump ahead quite a few chapters and talk about one more moment in Abraham's life. So in chapter 21, we see that uh, God follows through with his promises. Surprise, surprise again. Um, that was sarcastic. God always follows through with his promises. <laughs> he gives them a son, Abraham and Sarah, a son named Isaac. And then in chapter 22, it is really a well-known passage in the Bible, but um, probably not well read. Uh, but God puts Abraham to the test, really the ultimate test. Uh, God essentially asks Abraham to give back to him what he's given him. God essentially asks Abraham to give him Isaac back, even though God gave him Isaac. And so what I want to do is I want to read verses 1 through 14. It's not a big section. Like I said, I think it's a well-known passage, but not a well-read one. And so uh, read with me here in verses 1 through 14. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. <laughs> 
He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so they both of them went together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. So this is a pretty crazy uh, story, if you think about it, right? This was obviously Abraham's biggest test of faith, and it says in Scripture that God wanted to test Abraham. He wanted to see how faithful are you, how committed are you to me. Um, and of course, this story is also a picture of what God did for us when he, in fact, didn't spare his own son and instead killed his son Jesus on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven. Um, but this is also a real story that happened to real people a few thousand years ago. And so I want us to notice uh, one thing about Abraham's faith here. I want to notice his unwavering faith in this moment. And I think it'll just kind of shed a little bit more light on kind of a disturbing uh, passage. But in verse 5, I think in the U version it's highlighted or in bold or something like that. Um, but look back at verse 5. So Abraham and Isaac, they're, they're, they got everything they need for a, a, a burnt offering to God, a sacrifice except for um, an animal. And they're going up to the mountain as was the custom uh, back in ancient Mediterranean uh, days. What they would do is they would go up on mountaintops to meet and talk with their gods. And so he's doing that. He's going up to talk to God. And um, in verse 5, the, the, uh, the people that are with Abraham, he goes to them and he says, hey, uh, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to, again to you. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Even though Abraham is doing exactly as God told him, right? He's doing exactly as God told him. He's going up and he's going to offer Isaac back to God. Um, but he tells his servants that are with him or the other people that are with him on this journey, he's like, hey, me and Isaac are going to go up and worship and then we're going to come back. Both of us are going to come back to you after this. And so Isaac, or Abraham has this faith. He knows that something's going on. He knows that somehow God is going to provide. He knows that somehow God is going to come through. He knows that this isn't exactly what he knows about God, and this isn't God's character. Um, but he knows that he's being tested. He knows that somehow God's going to provide something else, some other way. He doesn't know what yet. And then in verse 8, we see this kind of faith again. In verse 8, Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. So again, we see Isaac's like, hey, uh, dad, where's the, like, where's the animal for the burnt offering? And Abraham's like, God will provide it. Don't know, God will provide it. And we see that, amazingly, both of these things ended up being true. The writer of Hebrews states in Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, he says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. So we've got to think about that for a second. God had given him Isaac. He had said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. All of the families of the earth will be blessed through you, Abraham. Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And so Abraham knows this whole time that God's going to provide something. God's going to provide another way. And he even thought, according to the author of Hebrews, that if it came to that, God could raise Isaac from the dead. That's some pretty crazy faith. 
But in a way, Isaac was kind of already a resurrection from the dead, if you think about it. Because God had already, in bringing Isaac to them, had already brought life out of something that was dead. He brought Sarah's womb, old, old closed womb of old age and, and Abraham's old age. He brought a son to them out of that. And so Abraham had seen that miracle firsthand, and so this really wasn't more of a stretch. But he considered that God was able to even raise him from the dead. I think that's pretty crazy. That's some pretty crazy faith. Um, so this is the story of Abraham in a nutshell. There's not a whole lot that happens after this in the story. Abraham um, kind of goes off in peace like Luke Skywalker um, not really, but a little bit like that. Um, but this is, this is Abraham in a nutshell. He had great faith. He had times where he failed greatly. Um, and if you read the whole, the whole story, the whole uh, 14 chapters, you'll find a lot of other areas where he demonstrated faith and a lot of other areas where he sinned, where he messed up bad, where he had a lapse of faith. And so what do we learn from all of this? Hopefully there's a point because of these uh, 14 chapters I just gave you an overview of are not a Jason Bourne documentary. Um, but I think that Abraham's life really shows us that a continued life of faith is what pleases God. Abraham had some mistakes in his life. He had some bumps and journeys in the road. But a continued life of faith is what pleases God. And that's our point for tonight. Abraham clearly had some faults. He had some sins. He had lapses of faith. But God worked through a sinner like Abraham to bring about a people and eventually a savior in Jesus Christ. And in the same way, God can work through us as sinners to bring about his plan for his kingdom. How many of you guys have seen the new, uh, the new Spider-Man movie? Not like the one about to come out, obviously. Really, only like 20 of you? Okay, you're familiar with the Spider-Man story, right? Peter Parker, you know, traditionally he's kind of this shrimpy nerd that gets bit by a spider and then all of a sudden he's like, a superhero, a kid superhero, right? Um, and in, in the latest movie, if you haven't seen it, no spoilers here or anything, but they did a really good job of portraying this kind of Peter Parker ar archetype. You know, he's a shrimpy, nerdy kid. Um, he's not really that great at anything. He gets bit by the spider, and all of a sudden now he's like a boy superhero. He's Spider-Man. Um, and throughout the movie, he makes some mistakes, right? He blunders some stuff with the bad guys. He, uh, he doesn't communicate very well. He, like, almost catches the bad guys like 20 times. Just can't do it, right? Until the very end, maybe. I don't know. No spoilers. He might catch him. He might not. Um, but at least up until then, there's some, there's some blunders by Spider-Man, right? He disappoints Tony Stark, who's kind of his like newfound uh, father, ro fatherly role model type of guy. Um, and in all reality, they portrayed Peter Parker very well, that he's an unlikely superhero, right? Um, but thinking of Peter Parker in this kind of superhero archetype, let me ask you guys this. Why is it never the good-looking, cocky jock who's got it all together and the prettiest girlfriend who gets bit by the spider? Why not? Because that's even more unrealistic. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, I think it's because we all want somebody we can relate to, right? We all want a story we can relate to. Because no matter how prideful we are, no matter how big we think we are, how good we think we are at this or that, deep down we all know that we're not perfect. We all know that we're sinful. We all know that we make mistakes. We all know that we're not really as smooth as we come off all the time or try to portray. And so we like a story that we can relate to. Somebody that messes up but still, you know, tries their hardest. Somebody that makes some mistakes but still does the right thing in the end. Those are the stories that really grip us, the stories that really inspire us. And I think this is kind of what God is doing with this story in Abraham here, too. I mean, Abraham's the father of our faith. Again, he's, he's, kind of the, he's the one that everybody looks to as the father of our faith. And yet, God puts some of his most embarrassing moments ever in the Bible. And I think we know, again, that if our stories were to be written out in the Bible, there'd be some pretty embarrassing parts of our lives for people to read as well. But that's the thing is I, I think God wants us to be able to relate to the people in his word. God wants us to be able to look at these stories of uh, great men and women in faith and be able to say, yeah, you know, I, I can try my best too. I can, I can be faithful too. I'm going to have some bumps in the road. I'm going to have some moments of sin, but I can be faithful to God. And so I think that's why God didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't sugarcoat his word. 
God works, has worked, and continues to work through sinners like Abraham, sinners like me, and sinners like you. And that's what this, that's what this whole sermon series really is about. So what do we know? So we know that Abraham was a sinner. We know that we're sinners. We know that God works through sinners. So how do we apply what we've learned from the story of Abraham? I think really we can take a couple things and, and, and apply them generally in our lives. I think we need to remember that our sin points to the need for a savior. My sin, your sin, Abraham's sin, all of our sin, it, you know, even if we're leaders in the faith or fathers of the faith, our sin points to the need for a savior. The Bible says no one is righteous, no, not one, except for Jesus Christ who is righteous and died on the cross and is able to give us his righteousness in his place through his sacrifice. So I think we can remember that our sin points to the need for a savior. We remember that a continuing faith like Abraham's is what pleases God, knowing that there's gonna be times in our lives when we mess up. There's gonna be times when we sin. There's gonna be times when we have lapses of faith, but it's a continued life of faith that pleases God, just like Abraham. And I don't say this that we might find comfort in our sin, um, but instead to find comfort in the powerful God that loves us and works in us despite our shortcomings. So if there's one overarching thing that we learned from Abraham, it's that we should live lives of continued faithfulness and trust that God is powerful, and a, powerful enough to work in us despite our failures. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now and, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for all of the things that you have given us to learn about you and to learn about your people. God, we thank you for bringing about your son Jesus through pretty ordinary people like us that we can relate to. Thank you for making even the hallmarks of our faith, the greatest men and women of faith, pretty relatable ultimately. And God, I thank you for not expecting perfection, but expecting faithfulness from us because that's something that we can do. And we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice on the cross. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.